this raises a whole lot of important questions now about the way people experience technology. I mean, I know, uh, I mean, to the null example, but let's say I sit down in my living room, there's a television on, and I can't even get my kids to watch television anymore. <laughs> so we'll say, let's sit down and watch this film, and we'll sit down to watch the film, and I'll be looking at them, and they'll be on their <laughs> iPads or iPhones, and I'll say, hey, Watch television. We're supposed to watch television together. <laughs> <laughs> it used to be, you know, can't we all sit down and have dinner together? Now it's, can't we all watch television together? And, well, your and grandfather asking you to sit by the fireplace. <laughs> yeah, no, it seems to be like an old curmudgeon. <laughs> but no, it really does raise questions of how aware of the space and how much in a space is anybody mm. at any time, and how sure. do all of these lessons from the 90s play out today? So, I mean, maybe to jump a little bit ahead, I'm looking at this work now and thinking now 15 or 20 years later where we're at. Um, what do you guys think about where architecture plugs into these discussions? Yeah. And also, I, why is architecture so absent from these discussions? And why has it become so boring? <laughs> Which? You know, architecture. Okay. Honestly, no, what's interesting is that, uh, you know, and I was just, Mark and I were just talking about this before I got up here, is that in this period, and the reason I start out by saying we had this kind of kids in a candy store thing. Um, we, were, we were kind of at the right age, right? In our, what we were, we were on, our, what we were then? So sort of somewhere between late 20s and mid-30s. 15 years younger, years younger than we are now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the kind of, we were at that moment in our, in our careers where we were still kind of, you know, we could experiment. Um, we weren't really tied to, you know, big practices or whatever. You know, we had a lot of, of sort of freedom, let's say, right? And all of a sudden, the tools changed radically. And I remember, and I like that story I told of Tom and, and Eric, you know, it was, a, it, it was a radical rupture to have those tools in, at our disposal. So I, I think that there was an interesting kind of perfect storm, right, of a generation of, of frustrated and, you know, young radical architects who, who, were, who were dealing with these tools, looking at the art world, looking at the world of, of, of you know, philosophy or other areas, mathematics, and then um, sort of coming together and, and then producing these kind of crazy what you see in the show here, these, all these projects are kind of crazy breaks, right, ruptures. Since then, um, there's been, well, of course, then there was, of course, the 9-11 uh, situation and the dot-com crash, the Lehman crash in 2008. Um, uh, so there's been a kind of a number of sort of things that have taken the wind out of the sails, let's say, of sort of the advances in, in technology. It all went to social networking, for example, a lot of it, right, a lot of the innovation. Um, so I'm, you know, the thing that really amazed me, I mean, the other day when Google bought those goggles, right, at three and a half billion, whatever it was, I remember taking the, those guys from that New York Stock Exchange to Seagraph in 91, 96. It was, no, no, we want to look at monitors. And at that time it was CRT monitors, not even flat screens. And, um, and so that kind of, that, that, that we were like so um, uh, hungry to, we actually wanted them to do retina scanning technology. We wanted to actually laser into their eye, the back of their eyes, the, the New York Stock Exchange, so that they would be, <laughs> you know, completely immersed. You know, that, that, but that was the kind of naivete, but at the same time, the kind of exuberance that we had. So I wonder today, and I, you know, we both teach in a number of schools, and I'm constantly wondering if, in fact, um, that hunger, that desire, and that kind of need to experiment um, is not as heightened at the moment for whatever reason. I don't know what it is. Now, whether it's got something to do with the fact that we're in a different kind of lull with all the multitasking and social networking and the, the kind of the, the, what the virtual existence has become in terms of social spheres, right? Or it's another kind of quiet before the storm. Um, and we may see a kind of you know, revival of much of this stuff, and hopefully architects are back in the trenches, and they take the risks to get there. Uh, because you know, the other thing that should be noted, I don't know about you, and I'm sure you did, you know, we got a lot of flack for doing the stock exchange back then. It wasn't sort of a, a f people didn't just say, oh yes, architects doing virtual reality makes perfect sense. It was the opposite. It was like, why are you guys doing this? What are you doing in this space? We, got, we, we had, you know, kind of, uh, email eggs thrown at us by, by architects when we ended up in architectural record with the project or PA or whatever it was. Um, so it, was, it wasn't so, and, and in a way, you know, walking into this room today, what amazes me about the show, the stuff is all still very radical. Um, it isn't, it, none of that work in there has become mainstream. Uh, so I'm interested in that. Bernard's. 
Bernard's, Bernard's maybe. No, I mean, I think that, that'll teach these guys for not showing up, but we can talk about... <laughs> <laughs> no, I think we can talk about Bernard and, and Cox, but I think Bernard's has actually become very mainstream. But no, it's true. Yes, you're right. I, I didn't mean it that way. I meant the kind of uh, the research level. <laughs> Bernard. Well, I think there's a reason for that. Yeah. Because though he appeared in the fold, as a sort of secret agenda of Deleuze, he, he was actually, architecturally, he was very traditional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he talks about the frame, and Deleuze took that notion of the frame. So he is a, right, don't forget Euclid, right? That was Bernard's uh, sort of, we all thought like Bernard is like going fully hardcore topological, but he says like, don't forget Euclid, yeah. right, for, t for 20 years. Yeah. And I think that's a success because that, sep that Zemprian separation of the tectonic and the ornament, that, that made it very successful Be because you look at like my stuff where there's no separation, where you like walk in the ornament, so to speak. Right? I, I went there with an art historian and he, and he was like looking at these ripples coming from the sensors. He was like, Robert Adam. <laughs> he was thinking like that's ornament. And, uh, but then in a sort of another relationship. And I, I actually, I, I moved my position. I, I thought I sort of, well, for that project, it, it was okay. But actually that notion of fascination, uh, also critics uh, comparing it to Wagnerian manipulation of crowds, the fact that they are these huge masses, uh, the, the fact that people go berserk in the space, that they had to stop children from manipulating the sensors because they were going wild. I, I've seen a woman sit in a, in a lotus in the, in, like, you know, like mean, doing the, Zen the meditation the in the projections. I saw really weird stuff. <laughs> and, uh, this was and Holland. I, no, this was no, Holland I, in that period. No, no, she was not. She was Californian. <laughs> <laughs> and for her, and for her, it was like acid, you know, that whole building. And I was at a certain th moment, I was thinking, <clears throat> maybe it is too close to fascination and immersion, and and to the sublime, and and like, and that that there's no that it's not a, an accident that these masses go through so excited and so exalted, and, and maybe there is, and that's the Bernard, yeah. I think, because I remember like finishing that project, and I was sitting by the phone for like half a year, because I thought now I get like 20 commissions, and I never got a phone call, <laughs> <laughs> because that thing is so incredibly radical, you know, and it's not like, can you build a water pavilion for us, mm -hmm. because it's like an extreme church, it's an, it's a, it is a very weird experience. And uh, so I think the distance that Bernard creates. Well, yes and no. I mean, it, it, well, well, let me ask you. The fact that you else. can hang it in an elevator and uh, in a bedroom makes it very successful. <laughs> no, no, but also connecting an algorithmic approach to a manufacturing approach. Sure. I mean, that's very much in a kind of, well, I, we asked them today. I mean, the, the maker culture, yeah. I mean, like the maker bot culture. Custom mass customization. Wasn't there. But in a, it, I mean, now it is here, and it's a very interesting relationship to Bernard. But also the whole approach to BIM. You know, Bernard was also really thinking in terms of BIM. I mean, there's a conservative thing about it, about thinking like that. But I mean, that was really the, his vision. There's, there's another way that I, I kind of see the, um, the, sub, the subtext, and, and maybe Lisa can speak to this because of what our experience on, on the stock change, which is. I think part of the struggle at that time, um, coming out of you know, Pomo and Decon and everything that was beginning to happen, was an intuition by a generation, uh, by us and many others in our, in our generation, um, that we needed to regain a kind of expertise um, and have a kind of position of being expert, right? Because what was beginning to happen is it was a kind of degradation of the architect into this sort of role of, which we see today, I mean, quite frankly, you know, to sit in a room with a client who doesn't understand your expertise necessarily, right, sees you as one of the number of so-called consultants, and you then, and, and if you kind of run a traditional firm, you have to kind of sublimate yourself to that and become, you know, you can't show those stripes too much. There's a real, I think, the subtext that I read is a, is a desire to regain a kind of traction as an architect and to say, yes, this is the kind of expertise we, we have and that we can employ. Um, without be more, I, I got you, but I got to ask you a more personal question. Sure. Because I know 
the New York Five, let's say, yeah. and, and also, let's say, Dutch modernism, those were very strong languages which held sway over a lot of where we were. And, you know, there were people that were second and third generation even taking that New York Five language and trying to refine it or divert it a little bit or do, do something with it. And the same thing in the Netherlands. It was this very monolithic notion of what a, a language would be. Right. How much was the digital a path to developing a language? And how much was the digital a way of breaking, let's say, with that New York Five or with the Dutch modernism for you three? Well, I think it was a, more about a break rather than the creating was the outcome, but it started with, definitely with a break, which, you know, we came in at the tail end of decon, but it was really a fascination with um, trying to find a new form of expression that was inspired on the one hand with uh, early avant-garde collages uh, methodologies in the late 60s and 70s, and then incorporating multimedia, which at the time, you know, was limited to photography, collage, video, always anticipating the ability to incorporate the motion graphics and so on, that, and the ability to work with complex geometries and animation in the computer. So I think that it was a way to try and escape, I think, the kind of weight. This uh, earlier comment about architects regaining some kind of ground as being experts, and I think that one should be very careful to differentiate between being an expert and being a specialist. And I think that one of the things that we found incredibly liberating was to be able to um, suddenly regain some of the territory that architects have always been invested in that's not just on a very straight and narrow understanding of building per se, but understanding the relationship of building to culture at large, to understanding an integrated idea of technology. Um, you know, so that all of those projects in some way kind of go and in, into other territories. So, you know, Lars, when you talk about taking over from the set designer, taking over from the experience designer, the exhibition designer, the you know, even to a certain extent, fabrication and contractors, really thinking much more holistically. For us, it was very much the same thing. It was becoming somebody that could look very holistically, very broadly, um, from a 40,000 foot view, and then from an incredible amount of, you know, level, high level of detail simultaneously. But so we got to open it up to the audience. But if you're right, then what happened? Because I think um, That's Hani's mentioning shop. <laughs> no, he didn't. No, no, it's, no. In shop, I, I have think, to live in that city, so I have to be. Careful. No, no, they're really interesting because they, you know, they they started <laughs> off. They used to advertise themselves as the developer-friendly Frank Gehry, yeah. which used to really upset me because Frank Gehry is the developer-friendly <laughs> Frank, Frank Gehry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean actually, Frank really works on a budget and yeah. you know delivers sure. projects. So I, I thought that was slightly offensive, but. They took that Gary Technologies model mm -hmm. of BIM and really tried to push that expertise of project delivery, project development. I mean, they had a lot of dough with the Sharples to back them up to develop stuff. But they actually became this new kind of practice, which is very interesting and is about um, you know, engaging BIM, let's say. And I'll tell you that the exhibition coming down the pike really is dealing with that part of digital technology, which is the BIM part. But what happened with the media part? Because what I see in this show is so much contemporary relevance. I mean, if we walked Larry Page through the show, or we walked you know, people that are dealing with Apple stores through this show, they would say, wow, this is actually dealing with media in an environmental way, and this is interesting. And, you know, this would be relevant to a self-driving car or, you know, Microsoft Home or whatever those things would be. And architects aren't in that discussion anymore mm. the way they were then. So what do you, what do you think happened? I mean, I, I think that the profession, I have a lot of ideas what happened. And a lot of them I can't say while well, it's being, you know, simulcast. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but just to put it kind of carefully, the profession, the profession of architecture, in a strange way, was kind of the enemy to the, to the, to the, to the kind of expertise that I'm talking about and where we were getting. It turned back into, you know, 
honestly, that group, which I won't mention their name, but you did, and other groups like them that start with B and other letters, they, they, they have become the, they are, they're not that different than, than the established firms with three letters, a lot of them, from the 1940s, you know, 40s, 50s, and 60s. It's just become, they just have new clothes on, and they've embraced technology, in such, they've embraced the business. But didn't we see the same with Archigram becoming high tech? I mean, if you look at the work of Peter Cook and Cedric Price and David Green, how cultural and, and radical they were, and how little they built, and then compared to high tech no, in no. the 70s, and then suddenly they take over all the, all the clients of bankers and. No, no, it's true. When it, went, no, when it went from there's when always it went a from, second phase, which is yeah, but we didn't not get cultural. To, but we didn't get to the first phase. That's the problem. I think we were the first phase. No, no, I know. But for example, <laughs> the transition from the Pompidou to the Bank of Hong Kong. Yeah. Okay. We didn't build the Pompidou yet. In, In other words, that, tiny I'm just little there's a lot of people doing <laughs> a wet one. <laughs> a, tiny little, a little wet a pump, a mini pump, a little wet no. But I, I think this whole discussion of media mm. experience, who's responsible for bringing that into the public realm and spatializing it, it's an unfinished project. And frankly, I'm not worried about Jonathan Ive cracking the nut of what it's like to be in a media space because Jonathan Ive doesn't have that in his wheelhouse. Sure. I mean, so, but I do think sooner or later, this kind of experimentation is gonna Return. get looked at again in, in architecture. No. Oh. But so, we should open this up to questions from the audience. I mean, didn't we feel like we were trying to, sorry, to, <laughs> to improve on the work of Gabot? Of course. And to improve the work of Kiesler. How often did we discuss these people? And so, the, that will be returning. There, there must be cycles. Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a stone skipping, I think, always, in terms of there's a kind of stone skipping through history and a sort of amnesia between these blocks. Yeah. Uh, and it's generational. Um, and I do, I do think, that's what I'm saying, it could be the lull before the storm. I'm not, I'm not one of those guys saying, oh, the new generation is not radical enough or they're not you know, right. getting off. Yes, I am. You just and, don't say, well, you say they have three no, letters. You're, but you're it, but it, may be, it may be, you know, I don't know, our son is, what, 17? Maybe that generation or yeah. the one. But there, there is a kind of a, a, a groundswell. But you the, can feel kind of that. The students we are teaching go to SOM and shop well, and yeah. whatever. No, the, the people we train go to yeah. SOM and shop. Because oh. <laughs> they get okay. better paid. Yes. Grateful. Go ahead. There was a question. I think yeah, I saw a hesitant hand. Oh, there it is. Um, hello. My name is Gregorio, and um, I have a weird question. So, um, I've got the perfect group. For that. <laughs> what? Uh, what was the um, when when you were young? Uh, I mean, <laughs> we're talking about you. When you were younger, younger uh, students. <laughs> um, what was going on? I mean, what kind of project formally I'm talking about the drawings of architecture were you doing? And what was the relation with, uh, I think you were still studying, uh, studying, sorry for my poor English, uh, architecture, but um, uh, what was the relation with the group of Peter Eisenman, the Institute for Architecture and, Public, uh, and Urban Studies and the magazine Oppositions that finished in 85, so you probably were not but I don't know, but, and my question is also, uh, don't you think there is a connection between what you did? Uh, because in the exhibit, I see a lot of reflection of pure geometry and oh, the question wow. of form in architecture and in a way, the autonomy. I mean, I'm sorry to use this word, old word, but there is more connection between you and the what Peter Eisenman did, and, and all the, the, this, oh this freedom from funct function. Hey, hey, you were with me there. Then, I don't Question know if my question is clear, but. No, Pe well, Peter, Peter who? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I mean, because Gary, uh, uh, Bernard Chumi, and all them were part of this group that were trying to liberate the architecture from corporate functionalism, et cetera, and bring, I mean, now Peter Eisenman is studying Palladio and, 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 and the architecture well, no, of I mean, Renaissance, I, which is geometry. I know 
you know, for me, I was shocked and um, drawn to what you all were doing, but I saw it as not a formal geometric, not a purely formal and geometric research, no, of course. but the focus on kinesthetics and movement and experience and the focus on media and um, image, you know, it, it was fairly unprecedented. And, and I think it maybe, you know, came from while well, you were students or, you know, maybe it actually just came from the, the milieu. I do think the connection with the art world, sure, you know, which we don't have time to talk about, but, mm, but you know, important. the art world when we were young um, <laughs> was really more of a dialogue. You know, like Frank Stella was using computer software and playing around with architecture, and Richard Serra was trying to figure out how to build torqued ellipses, and it was a fairly healthy exchange with art and architecture, which very rapidly turned into a very hostile relationship where the sculptors were like, no, we're the ones that do the architecture without the toilets, and you're the ones that do the architecture with the toilets. <laughs> And, and, it, and I mean, we're the one, they're the ones who get a lot of money. And, yeah, and also, the by the way, I'm selling this, <laughs> so could you do me a nice, simple <laughs> white barn, you know, or yeah. white box? So, but, but the connection with the art world, I think, is not to be underestimated here, because I really do think that it's a very different world out there now. And, you know, and also, by the way, the artists are, are you know, running architecture practices, like Oliver. Oh, and, yeah. You know, they've got a hundred people doing CAD modeling and fabrication and so our students. Yeah. No, I think that's a good point. I mean, you know, if you look at who we apprenticed under collectively, I mean, we were both at Eisenman's office at the same time, me very briefly. Greg was there a bit longer. I studied under Frank Gehry, Annie studied, and then also interned under Daniel Libeskind, and then collaborated with him. I'm sorry, Annie. But, you know, he went to an art so, academy yeah. for he graduate was, he school. He was very good in those years. He was. <laughs> but you, he went to an art academy for graduate school. I went to Yale when it was really the ANA. It was architecture and art and there was half painting studios and half architecture studios and I had fraternized much more with the artist side than the architect side. So, and then working with Frank Gehry, well, who was Frank Gehry influenced by? Frank Gehry was, himself was very influenced by the art world. So there's, there is a lineage there. It's well, I'm going to tell the story. Lisanne's in a crit in her, your thesis year at, at Yale? My final semester. And her critics in front of her are Frank Gehry and Richard, and Richard Serra, right? And they start having a fight. Um, turns out poor Lizanne is just standing there with her project and she happened to introduce two curves on two cubes. And remember? And you wrote me this oh, big letter. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and Not they right. really had an argument over curvature mm -hmm. uh, and form. And you remember the... the, the Not that over was, the cubes. Well, no, it was... It was yeah. it's, that's not quite what the project looked like, but <laughs> it, 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 was, uh, it's, uh, it was the beginning of a decades-long debate between Richard Serra and a very kind of hostile set of exchanges and Frank Gehry over art and architecture and what is not art. And, and Annabelle just gave Richard Serra the... The League Prize, right? The New York right? League Architecture the Prize. prize. Yeah. <laughs> So. After somebody else couldn't come pick it up. But I think that, you know, um, you know maybe the kind of self-referential nature and autonomous nature of the work, it, I think our generation got there and felt it was kind of exhausted. Like, we, we're definitely all individuals that want to have a unique and distinct voice and explore our own paths and, you know, create something new and take risks and risk failure. But really embark upon architecture in a way to uncover new ways of creating environments and creating experience. And so for me, it was just like, it would, it would have been unnatural to follow those footsteps even further, to kind of remain engaged in a kind of school of thought um, that was being perpetuated at the time. But definitely the influence was there. I think we all somehow were influenced by the Cooper Union yeah. um, pedagogy, for instance early on.